Hello everyone. Today on our channel, we're delving deeper into the realm of angels and demons from a Christian perspective. If you're intrigued by this topic, I highly recommend subscribing to our channel and checking out our previous videos. Today, we're going to discuss a topic directly relevant to each of us, including Satan himself, hell. Have you ever noticed that in the Bible, when the present hell, also known as Hades, is mentioned, it's never described as eternal or permanent? Phrases like eternal fire or forever and ever are associated only with the future hell, also known as the lake of fire. Jesus used the word Gehenna 11 times when describing future hell. When a person dies without Christ, they immediately go to hell, a place of fire and torment, but this is not yet the eternal hell. At the great white throne judgment, the person will be judged and cast into the lake of fire, which exists eternally. Hades is not eternal because the Bible says this hell will be brought before the great white throne and cast into the lake of fire, Revelation 20, 11, 15. It's important to note that both Hades and the lake of fire are literally made of burning fire. Matthew 13, 40, 42 confirms this, stating just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age, dot, 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 and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Notice, there is no mention of hell being eternal here. Instead, it says at the end of the age, this means that the present hell, Hades, still exists and will remain occupied until that time. So there is a temporary hell called Hades, and an eternal hell known as Gehenna or the Lake of Fire. If you're interested in learning more about this topic, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and check out our previous videos. Hades is not purgatory, because according to the Bible, such a place does not exist. Hades currently holds all who reject Jesus, until the great white throne judgment. According to Revelation 20:15 and Matthew 25, 30, they will be cast into the lake of fire and outer darkness. In hell, there is no reunion of families. If you reject Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you will find yourself utterly alone in hell. You won't be able to reunite with your loved ones, sharing their company and enjoying what lies ahead. The only thing awaiting you in hell is torment and isolation. Family relationships represent joy but in hell, there is absolutely no joy. The belief in such family reunions is based on falsehood. In Psalm 27, 1, it says, dot, 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 lest I be like those who go down to the pit silence means no conversation and therefore no interaction with people. There will be no conversation or exchange of information with others in hell. In Jonah 2, 3, 7, we read out of the belly of Sheol, I cried, and you heard my voice, dot, 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 when my life was fainting away. I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you, Jonah, was alone, in anguish and forever, at least that's what he thought. But God saved him, and undoubtedly there was no one else around. The Bible contains many verses describing prisons, burning, tearing, beating with whips, handing over to torturers, burning lake of fire, and eternal darkness. When a person experiences such horrific suffering, it certainly does not foster communication or conversation. In Psalm 142.3, it says, dot, 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 you have made me know the path to life in your presence. There is fullness of joy at your right hand. Our pleasures forevermore Christians should more consciously share the message of salvation with people so they won't end up in this dreadful place. God has entrusted us with his precious word, which promises eternal life to those who accept it. In heaven, we will be with our loved ones who knew Jesus. We will never experience loneliness, pain, loss, or suffering. We will never be separated from those we love. This is God's promise. Perhaps you have followed a false religion that led you to believe in the idea of family relationships in hell. Most false religions are based on the dream or vision of one person. Some people follow the teachings of one person without any evidence or testimony of their claims and without any research. At the same time, many ignore the Bible, which is filled with historical, archeological, scientific, and geographical evidence of the risen savior. The Bible clearly states that an unbeliever one who rejects Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior will go to hell. Do not be deceived into thinking that there is anything good or pleasant in hell. There is nothing good in hell, let alone family comfort. Whenever Jesus confronted the Pharisees, he called them hypocrites. A hypocrite is a fake or a counterfeit. They pretend to adhere to beliefs, feelings, and virtues they do not actually possess. The Pharisees were the epitome of the worst kind of sin, and we will see why. The Bible records seven sins that are particularly abhorrent to God. The Pharisees were guilty of all seven, and even one more, the most serious of all blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. 
In Christian circles, we often hear people say, sin is sin implying that all sins are viewed equally. But the Bible actually shows that some sins are worse or more significant. In the Gospel of John 19.11, Jesus said to Pilate, He who delivered me to you has the greater sin indicating that not all sins are viewed equally. This is one reason why the Pharisees may find themselves among those who end up in the lowest level of hell. Ultimately, we must understand that it is the condition of the heart behind the sin that makes the sin heavier. In the Gospel of Matthew 15, 19, Jesus said, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. We may sin either out of ignorance or with deliberate rebellion against God. Although some sins are specifically described as abominations before God, all sins share one common trait any sin, no matter how insignificant, excludes us from heaven. Only the shed blood of Jesus can cleanse a person from all sins, regardless of what they have done, when they trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. In 1 John 1 9 it says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful, and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If the Pharisees considered themselves the highest religious group but sinned more than anyone else, then it would be very wise for us to examine ourselves more often. God sees the motives of our hearts and knows whether we act out of sincere love and care for others or if there is a hidden agenda behind our words and actions. Just as thick darkness covered the land of Egypt, Exodus 10:21, so now silence will stretch over the very heavens. The burning ones will no longer cry out, holy, 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 the saints will momentarily cease to sing about the lamb who was slain, Apostle John reports a silence in heaven for about half an hour Revelation 8.1. The heavens, the realm of highest praise, descend into solemn silence, akin to an army on the eve of battle. As all falls quiet on the stage, seven archangels are handed trumpets, and the spotlight falls on the angel priest, perhaps the Lord Jesus himself, who moves through the silence to stand at the altar with a golden censer and an abundance of incense. He is to light the incense before the throne. He performs what the Old Testament priests once did in the temple, when the assembled people fell silent, and the fragrant smoke of burning incense ascended to the heavens. But what cloud of fragrance now rises before the Lord? It is the incense from golden bowls, the prayers of the saints, Revelation 5.8. At the end of this age, the heavens hush to solemnly lift up the prayers of God's people, rising as worship before Him. John writes in the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints, ascended before God from the angel's hand, Revelation 8.4. But what are these prayers about? If summed up in one word, it is about justice. The Apocalypse calls scene of silence begins after the interlude of the sixth chapter, where John sees the Lamb ascend, one by one, removing seven seals. The removal of the first four seals leads to the appearance of various riders bringing violence, famine, and disease, Revelation 6.26. Hell follows closely behind verses 7 to 8. During the period of seal removal, the saints are martyred. Upon the removal of the fifth seal, John sees their host under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held Revelation 6-9. In the silence, listen closely to the theme of their prayer, and they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth, Revelation 6-10. And white robes were given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer, until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who would be killed as they were, was completed Revelation 6.11. This moment arrives in chapter 8. All falls silent, awaiting to hear the solemn appeals of the slain saints, calling upon God for vengeance for their bloodshed. Commentator Grant Osborne notes the silence in heaven is waiting for God's action, but it will not just be outpouring wrath, but God's response to the intercessory prayers of the saints, 6 11 repeated in 8:34. Thus, worship is at the heart of justice, Revelation 3:39. Soon, the aroma of worship rises from the wrath. God's judgment upon the unrepentant persecutors is not only a response to punishment for sin, but also to the prayers of the saints. Before this volcano of wrath, mouths do not open, eyes do not close. How does God react? Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake, Revelation 8.5. Fire descends, thunder resounds, lightning flashes, the earth shakes be silent, all flesh, before the Lord, for he is aroused from his holy habitation, Zechariah 2.13. Thus begins the final judgment, for verse 5 must be interpreted as the final judgment, 
not as a preceding trial leading up to this judgment. Again, God's wrath against the ungodly is not only a response to punishment for sin, but also a response to the prayers of his saints. The pleas of his children accompany this judgment, calling it forth. The most astonishing aspect of this text is that it portrays the prayers of the saints as the instrument God uses to initiate the end of the world with great divine judgments. The prayers of the saints accumulate on the altar before the throne of God until the appointed time when they, like fire, are taken from the altar and thrown to the earth, ushering in the culmination of God's kingdom. Does this astonish us? Are we inclined to doubt rather than appreciate such prayers? Are our prayers the result of sacrificial living? Or do we come to God only to ask Him to provide means of rescue to save us from our own folly? The prayers of the saints, as depicted here, are focused on the holiness and righteousness of God and the desire for it to be manifested in the execution of His justice. Are our prayers aimed at benefiting ourselves or bringing glory to God, shielded from many persecutions, the sweetness of this incense does not yet bring me as much pleasure as it could, and there was no need for it to do so. The whips of Egypt did not strike the back of my wife. Pharaoh did not cast my children into the Nile. The unjust judge has not yet denied me a hearing. Romans 12:19 did not have to confront an existential crisis, beloved. Do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But it was so for many saints, to whom injustice and sin inflicted even deeper wounds. Concerns about prayers invoking curses or calling for calamity often testify to a lack of compassion for our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world throughout history. Iteration of his vengeance, regardless of whether we can relate to these prayers for justice, such judgments take place in our worship. The first thing Israel does after being freed from Egypt is gather by the Red Sea, tears of gratitude streaming down their cheeks, voices joining in song to praise God for saving them, drowning their enemies like a stone Exodus 15.5. The saints of old perceived the crushing of enemies as God's covenant love for them praised the Lord, for he is good for his mercy endures forever. He struck Egypt in their firstborn, for his mercy endures forever, and brought out Israel from among them, for his mercy endures forever. With a strong hand and with an outstretched arm, for his mercy endures forever to him who divided the Red Sea in two, for his mercy endures forever and made Israel pass through the midst of it, for his mercy endures forever, but overthrew Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea. For his mercy endures forever, Psalm 136, 1, 10, 13 to 15. The psalmist cannot finish the sentences describing God's righteous judgments without inserting praise for God's love for his people, manifested in the same act. Thus, after the judgment prayed for is fulfilled at the end of time, we hear the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven exclaiming, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for true and righteous are his judgments. Because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants, Revelation 19.1.2. Thy kingdom come, when the angel priest reaches into the golden bowl, will he find our prayer there. While many of us may not often pray for God's vengeance to be poured out on the wicked, Jesus teaches us to fill this bowl in the Lord's prayer, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven, Matthew 6, 9, 10. Martin Luther once taught us that this means we should gather together all that opposes the reign of our God and pray curses, slander, and shame to every other name in every other kingdom. Let them be destroyed and torn to pieces, and let all their schemes, wisdom, and plans be reduced to dust. Let your kingdom come is a positive way of praying destroy every other kingdom that opposes your will or stands in your way. Or, as Piper exalts what we have in Revelation 8.1.5 is an explanation of what has happened to millions and millions of prayers over the last 2,000 years, when the saints again and again cried out, Let your kingdom come. Let your kingdom come, not one of these prayers, offered in faith, has been ignored. Not one has been lost or forgotten. Not one has been in vain or meaningless. They all gather at the altar before the throne of God. We pray for the sovereignty of God, for that sovereignty which will overcome all others. We pray for the return of King Jesus, knowing that judgment must come from his heavens, Revelation 1-7. We desire for God's righteous justice to be satisfied either at the cross or in hell. And most of all, we long for our Savior to come, for God's dwelling place to be with humanity again, let your kingdom come. Not one of our prayers for Christ to come, to bring his kingdom, and to rectify all our deepest mistakes will be lost. They are collected in the bowl, 
soon to be burned as incense before the throne and to rise like fire against our enemies. Some of us look to the sky, joining in this solemn silence, groaning in anticipation of justice and yearning for home. He will not disappoint. He will not delay one moment longer than his father has determined. As we wait, we shorten the distance and storm the gap with one beautiful weapon prayer. In the realm of religious beliefs and the concept of an afterlife, one of the most discussed and enigmatic notions is hell. For some, it's a place of torment and suffering, while for others, it's a symbolic representation of being distant from God. According to Christian teachings, hell is associated with a destination for those who reject God and His teachings. It's portrayed as a realm of eternal punishment, where sinners endure agony and torment for their transgressions. However, for many believers, hell isn't just a site of physical torture, but also serves as a symbolic reminder of the consequences of rejecting God's love and wisdom. There's an idea that hell represents not only physical suffering, but also spiritual separation from God. It's seen as a place devoid of divine presence, where souls experience spiritual emptiness and detachment from the source of all goodness. Many religious texts, including the Bible, describe the torments of hell as something real and terrifying. This imagery is often used as motivation for repentance and turning to God. It's believed that only through faith and confessing one's sins can one avoid the torments of hell and attain salvation. Regardless of how we interpret hell, its existence remains one of the most mysterious and controversial topics in the religious world. It prompts reflections on the nature of good and evil, humanity's fate, and the very nature of God.